There's some wonderful stories about these colony people. Yes. For example, this house over here was Ellen Shipman's house, who had on her calling card, geographically in Plainfield, socially in Cornish. <laughs> That's down there. Ah, attitude. Right, attitude. <laughs> there you go. They did have some fancy parties. They certainly did, absolutely. For sure. Yeah. That is so cool. Be careful, it may be dark in here. Thank you, Jim. Thanks. You're welcome. Thank You're welcome. You. <laughs> Jonathan Farwell. Oh, my, what a distinct privilege to see you. Well, it's on good stage. to see you, Fern. Oh, <laughs> I'd like to introduce you to some friends who are very excited to meet yes. you and speak with you. This is Kai Ober, Percy Mackay's granddaughter. So right. great to meet you. And this is Joanna Maxfield Parrish. Nice, yes, nice yes. to meet you. Joanna, wonderful. Yes. Well, well, we grandfather. have much to talk about. Yeah, yeah. And you are also a colony descendant. Yes. Yeah. My father was a composer who wrote music for the pageants and spent quite a lot of time up here from about 1912 to 1917. Wonderful. Well, I think, Jim, you and I should go and leave these descendants to catch up. So I we'll know. see you later. All right. Great. You, you two are the descendants of some of the very prominent people in the Cornish colony. And I feel as though I've actually stepped into a Maxfield Parish painting. Yes. That your grandfather was very, very involved in the creation of all of this. Oh, for sure. We know from designs that remain that he designed it, and he painted it. It was his hand and his brush, and newspapers of the time described the stage set as being the, the work, the painting by right, Maxfield right, Parrish. Right. It was written up in the newspapers as the most beautiful stage north of Boston. People are still enjoying it today. I think it would make him very happy. It's 101 Painted. years old. 101 this, years this old August. now as we speak. Yeah. And I've observed a wonderful luminescent quality about the blue. There must be some technical explanation for how he did that. People have often asked me, what, what color was Parrish Blue? He's so famous for that. And really, it wasn't just one color. It was the way he layered the blues that gave it that jewel-like tone. I can remember of my father's <laughs> pony horses, uh, which is one of his more celebrated Indian pieces because it's very short. But I don't think he ever played in front of a naked lady with an <laughs> arrow in her hands. Um, that uh, I find it very intimidating, but certainly she's beautiful. This is Diana the Huntress, uh -huh. and this statue, twice as big, yeah. was on the top of the Madison Square Garden uh, building in New York City. Uh -huh. And mothers going by with their children apparently would put their hands, or don't look at that lady, <laughs> put their hands over their took, eyes. Took her off Eventually they her. took her off, and in fact, this was Davida Clark, she had a very distinctive face, and it was considered yeah. a very Grecian profile, and St. Gaudens used her over and over again. That distinctive face, you can't miss it. Well, I'm curious about why St. Gaudens settled here in the first place, because if he had a business in New York, was he the founder of the Cornish colony, or was he simply the impetus because he invited other artists to the area? I'm curious about that. St. Gardens had just received the commission to create the memorial to Abraham Lincoln, the 16th president, the standing Lincoln in Chicago. We have a copy of it here on the grounds. 
Oh, I know. And he was looking for a place to work on that. And the wonderful line, his lawyer said, if you come up there, I promise I'll find you wonderful Lincoln-shaped men <laughs> to be models. <laughs> and, and he did. Didn't find him in Cornish, but he found him again across the way in Windsor. Langdon Morse, who was actually a state representative for Vermont, huh. he had the same rough, craggy features, same hmm. beard. All he needed was the suit. And they soon took care of that by going to Lincoln's tailor and having him make an exact replica of the suit that the president would have worn. So St. Gaudens put it on Morse and sent him around the fields here, and he said, you're not getting dirty enough. You have to, you know, rummage around a little bit, get it looking, looking as if it's been worn a little bit. And then he came in here and posed and, and did the statue. After that, St. Gaudens invited his friends, just as Beeman had brought him up. So the first to come was the artist Thomas Dewing, and then after Dewing, George IV Brush and Parrish and others, but they all came because of St. Gaudens' invitation. So I presume the real estate prices were attractive, too. Yes, <laughs> and of course, there's also the mountain, Mount Escutney, which was... Oh, Mount Escutney, yes, I've heard about it, yes. For them. It's a wonderful natural feature in the landscape, and they all loved it, so all of the people who came built their houses to make sure that they had an optimum view of it. beautiful place here, but what a magnificent view of Mount Oskotny. <laughs> yeah, we really, really love it. It's well, wonderful. it seems to be very important to this, this part of the world. Mm -hmm. Should we go down to the studio? Is it not in the house? No, it's actually down the hill. Oh, really? Yeah. Many of the Cornish colony members had detached studios. And most of them had children, right? Yes, mm -hmm. and my grandfather appreciated <laughs> being a little bit removed. Right, so yes. did my dad. Yeah. <laughs> Needed yeah, privacy. Yes. An yeah, artist at work. So. There was an enormous interest in both drama and music in the Cornish colony. My grandfather wrote the St. Louis Mask to help preserve the Cahokia mounds. And do I recall from the pictures I've seen that the cast of that pageant was something like 7,500. That's exactly <laughs> That's right. And actually, huge. I have a photograph, oh, and like the audience was about 100,000. So it was really quite an immense event. Mm -hmm. And with all this interest in pageantry, I should point out the bullhorn over there, which was used to speak to the also large cast of Caliban. And you know your right. father oh, yes, wrote the yes. music for yeah. that. By the yellow sounds. By the yellow sounds, yeah. exactly. Which and there was, of course, a chorus of 500 people and an orchestra of 100 to play your father's music. This was a time in which we didn't have television and radio and film and all these other distractions right. and, mm -hmm. and recorded music 24-7. And so people needed things to do. And people were either actors or singers or musicians or scene painters or prop builders or mm -hmm. helped with the costumes. Yep. And it represented a form of art that was much more communal. Yeah, I think both your father and my grandfather had that as a real ideal. Yeah. And also a deep love of nature. And that's where Benton comes in. He really believed in the influence of nature on people's lives, and I know many members of the Cornish colony. That was a, a very integral part to their thinking and to their lifestyle. Benton was a forester, and he continued to map areas and the wilderness throughout his life as long as he could. But he also had tremendous respect for a, a name that we know well here from the Marsh Billings National Site, Marsh. George Perkins Marsh was actually born here on this very property, but he wouldn't be able to recognize the property today. Do watch your step. The Vermont of Marsh's youth was a very, very different landscape. It had been clear-cut by axe. It had been nibbled close by sheep. We would all recognize the Vermont of Marsh's youth as an ecosystem in crisis. Well, it looks pretty verdant and wonderful now, and I see plenty of trees. How was it healed or cured? There must have been a lot of work done. To yeah. yeah, well, we actually have Marsh to thank for a lot of that because he was a keen observer. He noticed that when you clear-cut a hillside and a rainstorm comes in, mm -hmm. all of that topsoil that's not being held down by trees and greenery ends up in the ponds and in the rivers, and it leads to more catastrophic flooding. And in fact, in 1847, Marsh 
put a lot of the data that he'd been collecting together and actually drew the conclusion that humans were not only changing the environment, but they were actually changing the very climate of the planet. Oh, now, wait a minute. You, you're saying that as far back as that, what, what, what year were we talking about, 18... 1847. 47? That someone was talking about climate change, as which we discuss every day now. Yes, indeed. Furthermore, pollinators are in decline. That's bees, that's butterflies, all of these things that pollinate our flowers, not just the pretty ones, but the, the food crop flowers as well. Mm -hmm. So lots and lots of impacts here at the National Park. Well, that's terrible. It's frightening, actually. Yeah, it really is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you see the little yellow there on the leg? Oh, yeah. Right. It's collecting nectar and pollen. So these gardens have a Cornish colony connection. They were actually designed by a Cornish colonist, Charles Platt. Uh -huh. And also Ellen Shipman. You may have heard of her? Yes. Yes, I have. Yeah, she was a landscape architect and had a hand in many of the gardens in Cornish as well as around the country. She became quite famous for that. Right? She very much so. Yeah. And she actually designed the garden over at St. Gaudens. But it wasn't just her that had a hand in this site. It was Charles Platt as well. Charles Platt. He was an architect, a landscape architect, yes. an etcher, uh -huh. and he actually made this lovely fountain. Oh, wonderful. I mean, these are two national parks, Marsh Billings, Rockefeller, and St. Gaudens, that are really all about art and landscape. They're very much connected. This is a painting by Mariah Oki Doing, and she and her husband were the first artists to join St. Gaudens here in Cornish and were very influential. Maria Oakley Doing? Oki. Oki. Oki, Oki Doing. And she pronounced it Mariah. Oh, Mariah. Yeah. Okay. Well, she's not a household name, obviously, like Augusta St. Gaudens or Maxfield Parish. That's right. What, what's her connection with Cornish Colony? Well, because she came here so early, she and her husband, Thomas Dewing, who was a figure painter, were really core members of the colony. And they were also really influential in terms of the gardening craze here in Cornish. Oh. They had deep knowledge of plants and were passionate about gardening. right here to the right, and we have this beautiful space here. And, and something about the proximity of the garden to the Absolutely, house? Absolutely, yes. You, it was one continuous space as far as a, the architect it had in mind. And you have here another very important element in his design, a yes. pergola. You see the columns here, and then often covered with grapevines, uh -huh. because in addition to being a sculptural effect, there's also wine. <laughs> oh, yes, of course. Not to forget that. <laughs> I think this is the first time I've been in a pergola. <laughs> Through the garden, you'll notice this lovely et cetera. Sort of like a traffic circle. <laughs> <laughs> it's very much like, Yes, it is. Yeah. yeah. And then another pergola up there. And straight ahead, yeah. you can see this lovely classical statue. Ah, yes. A pan. Right there, all framed under this arbor here, so that you can have a sense that there's music playing in your garden and you had these classical elements throughout. And it seems to me from what I've learned so far that everyone around here loved nature and were in some measure environmentalists. Yeah, I think that was a, an important part of the Cornish colony. Also, there was a growing awareness about the protection of birds. Ah, what have we here? The Meriden Bird Sanctuary. The bird bath itself was here for the dedication of the bird sanctuary. And at the time, they also performed a play here in 1913, which was Sanctuary Bird Mask. Uh -huh. And the characters, the figures that go around the urn, they represent characters in that play. And the play was really to bring awareness to the plight of birds at the time. There was a lot of hunting, and the exotic birds were being killed for their feathers. 
So the play was really to raise awareness for that needless slaughtering and to bring empathy and awareness to what was going on. And it took place in the clearing. They had a pretty minimal stage set, sort of like a log drawn across. Mm -hmm. And they relied a lot on the natural surroundings and the bird baths and bird houses that they had created. And Percy Mackay's poetic mm -hmm. narrative and a lot of music and dance. One of the inspiring things about this mask was just the fact that it was about birds. I mean, birds are not only wonderful creatures in themselves, but they've always been known as symbols of imagination and of freedom. And I think that's part of what inspired people across the country to become more active in building some of these sanctuaries. <laughs> yeah, but a lot of the cause was kept going in major part because of the Bird Club's founder, Ernest Harold Baines. Tell me a little more about him. He sounds fascinating. Oh, Baines is great. He was a naturalist, he was an author, he was a photographer. And he had come to the area and settled over at Blue Mountain Park with his wife, Louise, who was also a photographer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they were invited by the owner of the park, Austin Corbin, who basically had Baines be the gameskeeper. And so Baines was interacting with all these animals, he was photographing mm -hmm. them, he was writing about these interactions, publishing these works. And he was kind of like a Dr. Doolittle type. He had a very <laughs> natural rapport and a lot of patience. Mm -hmm. And he would befriend some of these animals. In particular, he had gotten to know this little bear cub named Jimmy. And Jimmy would cause a ruckus. He would break into the Baines's kitchen pantry and start eating crackers. <laughs> Yeah, and unfortunately, Jimmy got too big, so they had to relocate him to the New York Zoological Park. Too big. But Baines had his hands full. Austin actually had him helping to reintroduce bison herds. And so they were kind of breeding them in the park and then hmm. working to send them to Montana and Yellowstone. And this was a huge initiative with Teddy Roosevelt, and Baines and Roosevelt were actually friends. And did you know that we actually have that correspondence in a scrapbook? that when open said Buffalo Scrapbook, and it is Bain's correspondence with Roosevelt, mm -hmm. with the American Zoological Society, with national figures setting up the American Bison Society. It also includes all the articles that he wrote about mm -hmm. bison, and it has a logo that Maxfield Parrish made for the American Bison Society, specifically at the request of Ernest Harold Baines. <laughs> So this whirlpool of activity that I'm sensing went on throughout this period of the Cornish colony it created ripples that extended throughout the country and affected the culture of the country. Absolutely, yeah. When St. Gordon's came here, many ideas were fomenting in the country. You had women thinking that they ought to be able to vote, for example. And in Cornish, they established something called the, the Cornish Equal Suffrage League. And Juliet Rubley was part of that, and then Ritter Binner, a poet, was part of that. Juliet Rubley was very familiar with Margaret Sanger, and they talked about birth control. And, oh, wow. <laughs> but there was also the issue that a lot of money was coming in. They create a kind of a social stratification. They did indeed, because not only did you have the plain field folk, but you had these New York people. This New York folk, the city ladies coming in too. They came from rather privileged class. So these people who had lots of money really thought that maybe they could do something for the local women. And this notion came out of the progressive movement, the progressive era. I see. And that really was the nucleus out of which the whole Mothers and Daughters Club began. Mm -hmm. And they came up with this idea that maybe they could use this building as something called the Mother and Daughters Club industry. Here, you can see them, they're just sewing. Uh, but eventually, you see this loom back here. Yeah. That's where they started doing carpets and rugs. Uh -huh. And the local women thought that this would be a good idea. They could sell these things, mm -hmm. and that would bring money into the local community. Of course. Industry. But, yes. But the whole idea of cooperation and community was really what it started with. I see. I see. Were art colonies created intentionally? It's a very good question. Mm -hmm. Most art colonies evolved organically. I think the exception is McDowell, which was a very intentional colony. It was uh, founded mm -hmm. by Edward McDowell, the composer and his mm -hmm. pianist wife. And they invited artists to come and do residencies. So they were selected 
Now, in contrast to McDowell, the Cornish colony evolved in the more typical way, which was very organic and mm -hmm. was based a lot on social relationships that were established in New York through various clubs and artistic associations mm -hmm. and in Boston. And I just don't think St. Gaudens could have imagined or predicted how this colony would develop and the range of people who would be attracted to it from all different walks of life and different career paths. I don't think he could have either. Yeah. And it's still evolving. In fact, there is a plein air painting class that's taking place right now around the corner. Right now? Right now. <laughs> and it's wonderful to see the tradition being continued. It's like a trip into the past. But what really got to me in participating in this whole project and learning this history <laughs> was the fact that the growth of art depended in some measure on the way they shared. <laughs> it made it a kind of a utopian community. And having come to live here in order to be together as a community of artists, they created a world here. And they were celebrating their own human individuality. Yes. And that's what artists do. And when they do it together, it's quite amazing.
Vermont PBS, partnering with local filmmakers to bring you stories made here. For more, visit vermontpbs.org.